Last week, the first U.S. combatant casualty in Ukraine, 22-year-old ex-U.S. Marine Willie Cancel, was reported in the media. A volunteer fighter working with a military contractor, he was not a combatant for the U.S., though. The U.S. administration was quick to make statements discouraging people from going to Ukraine to fight and to distance themselves from any who do. Perhaps for fear of further escalating the conflict, but more likely because aiding and abetting the recruiting of volunteers for a foreign war is against the international rules and laws of conflict. Just over 82 years ago, in another war instigated by a guy in Moscow, this was a huge issue as well, in the Finnish Winter War. I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is Into Context, a Time Goes documentary format where we give historical context to today's headlines. On November 30th, 1939, three months after entering into an alliance with the Nazi German Reich to divide between them Baltic and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union invades Finland. You can learn all about the invasion over on our World War II in real time series. But the long and short of it is, that Soviet de facto dictator Joseph Stalin wants to push his border northward and westward. He claims it is to secure Leningrad from future foreign aggression, but already has plans to annex all of Finland, one of the new European sovereign nation states that two decades earlier had been part of the Tsar's dominions. So like the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the Winter War is a war of aggression, waged by a strong power against a small one it considers should be firmly within its sphere of influence. And also like the 2022 invasion, the Winter War receives a huge amount of media attention in the Western world. World War II has started by now, but it is in the period known as the Phony War, the winter of 1939 and 40, after the fall of Poland, when there's not a lot of war happening on the continent, meaning all eyes are on Finland. It is also a time where authoritarianism seems to be on the march everywhere. The narrative of a small democratic nation bravely resisting the ambitions of a dictatorship is hugely potent, and world opinion is on Finland's side. On December 14th, the League of Nations expels the Soviet Union from its ranks. The same day, the League's assembly adopts a resolution urging its members to give Finland all the material and humanitarian assistance they can. And Britain, France, and Sweden do deliver large amounts of weapons and ammunition to Finland. Brazilian coffee farmers donate many thousands of bags of coffee. Norway, Hungary, Switzerland, Italy, and Belgium also donate everything from artillery to clothing. But they all stop short of sending soldiers, or officially sending soldiers. Britain and France are initially reluctant to send troops because doing so would mean declaring war on the USSR, and then they'd be at war with them and Germany at the same time. Sweden sending troops would also mean declaring war on the USSR, and that would mean for them that once Finland was swallowed by the Soviets, which everyone thought would soon happen, they'd be next. So, despite great sympathy for Finland in both the Swedish government and the public, the government remains committed to their non-belligerent status. So much so that when Britain and France eventually propose a plan to send troops to Finland in February despite their concerns, Sweden refuses to grant transit rights through its territory. Other countries are either also committed to their neutrality or simply too small and distant to make an impact. But with their governments unwilling or unable to directly intervene, many non-Finns will go themselves. By the end of the war, 11,640 foreign volunteers will have entered the Winter War on Finland's side. The majority will be Swedes, some 8,680 of them. 1,010 will be Danes, 695 Norwegians, 373 Americans or Canadians, one even Trinidad-born, and the rest made up of states spanning all of Europe. Only 13 will be British, although more will be in transit by the time the war ends, and in a fun bit of trivia, one of them will be Christopher Lee, Dracula to the older among us, Count Dooku and Saruman to the younger. Out of the total number, a fairly moderate number, 43 volunteers, will die fighting for Finland. But what drives them to leave their country and go and fight for another one? Well, foreign volunteers in war are nothing new. In the 1770s, Lafayette traveled from his French homeland to fight for the ideals of the American Revolution. And just before the Winter War, at least 32,000 volunteers joined the Comintern organized international brigades to fight in the Spanish Civil War. 
It's easy to make the mistake of thinking that volunteers for Spain or for any other conflict get involved for clear ideological partisan reasons. When you start sifting through their stories, you see that in both Spain and in Finland, foreigners might volunteer for any number of personal or political reasons. For the Swedes in Finland, it's often a mix of affinity for their Nordic brothers and Swedish patriotism with some anti-authoritarianism thrown in. Recruitment posters and newspaper ads in Sweden carry texts like, now the world knows what it means to be a Finn. Show the world what it means to be a Swede. And some go a step further. Finland's fight is the fight of the Nordic countries, which is the fight of the Western world. The gravestone of a Swedish pilot will read, Fallen in Finland for Sweden's honor and Nordic independence. Nordic patriotism probably drives those Danes and Norwegians to volunteer as well. But an affinity for Finland stretches beyond just close neighbors. The 346 Hungarians who volunteer for Finland likely do so thanks to the linguistic similarities between the Hungarian and Finnish languages. Intellectuals from the 19th century onward use this to forge strong cultural bonds between the two nations, creating a sense of fraternity that many ordinary Finns and Hungarians feel to some extent. Even further afield, the volunteers from the American Legion are mainly first or second generation Finnish immigrants to the US or Canada. Some of them are returning again after fighting in the Finnish Civil War of 1918. Many of these volunteers fall into the category of what historian Nir Ariely calls self-appointed ambassadors, people who volunteer to represent what they believe the true values of their home state to be. But the simple allure of adventure also motivates some others. The desire to test their mettle in combat when their own country has yet to start military actions in the broader war or is committed to staying neutral. In the end though, every volunteer will have their own specific set of reasons for leaving their home and family to fight in a foreign war. But how did their own governments react when they did just that? Well, legally, sanctioning foreign volunteers are a big no-no. The Hague Convention of 1907 states that recruitment agencies or military units can't be formed on the territory of a neutral power. Although a following article does say that states don't have a responsibility for the actions of individual citizens. During the Spanish Civil War, many governments announced that existing legislation against enlisting in foreign wars would be enacted to stop volunteers traveling to Spain. Many of the states who signed the non-intervention agreement came to extend this to also barring volunteers joining the war. France closed its border with Spain and many countries declared passports to be invalid for travel to Spain, including the US. The extent to which all of this was enforced was patchy. Sweden passed the Act on Measures to Prevent Volunteers from Participating in the Spanish Civil War in 1937, but none of the 550 Swedes who went anyway were prosecuted upon their return. Nevertheless, the norm is that allowing your citizen to fight another government's war is something a government shouldn't do. Most government reactions to this happening in 2022 follow this pattern. But that, makes the Winter War something of an outlier because governments have allowed and even subtly encouraged their citizens to fight for the Finnish cause. In January 1940, in the context of circulating questions about the legality of Americans fighting in Finland, President Roosevelt announces that an American can fight for a foreign power without losing their citizenship, provided they don't swear an oath of allegiance to that country. And the British government also tacitly accepts their citizens joining the war. Members of the government work in recruitment offices or are members of the Finnish Aid Bureau. In February, the government is asked whether it intends to apply anti-foreign enlistment laws like it did in the Spanish Civil War, to which the government replies that it is simply complying with the League of Nations resolution we spoke about earlier. And even though Sweden is very careful throughout the war, to preserve its non-belligerent status, it also accepts the recruitment of its citizens. Initially, the government banned recruitment ads, but lifts this just before Christmas. The government approves the creation of a volunteer air force and agrees that up to 8,000 men eligible for military service will be granted leave to volunteer for Finland. They later raised this to 12,000. In January, the Soviet envoy in Stockholm protests at the number of volunteers flowing into Finland. 
The Swedes innocently point out that according to the Hague Convention, they don't bear any responsibility for the actions of private citizens. And what of the Finns themselves? Are they happy about self-appointed ambassadors coming to fight with them? Well, for starters, they don't actually have to do much marketing. Volunteers rush to embassies across Europe and North America as soon as war breaks out. Finland gladly welcomes most of them, but interestingly declares they will not register Germans or Russians as volunteers because of the conflicts of interest this would cause. Specifically for Russians, Finnish authorities are no doubt cautious about making their war look like an anti-communist crusade and thus upping the stakes for the Soviet Union into a war of survival. But are the volunteers who are accepted actually effective? That's a pretty hard question to answer. Only Swedes, Norwegians, and Finnish Americans will make it to the front lines while the war lasts, and even then for just a short period of time. The war lasts only until March 13, 1940. With all foreign volunteer forces, the biggest problems are lack of training and lack of shared language with the host army. That probably isn't a huge issue with Finnish Americans. Like we said, they have roots in Finland and many already fought in the Civil War. But it is with Swedes, many of whom Finnish officers notice have no skills on skis, have never fired a gun before, and have no clue what they got themselves into. In the interest of fairness, I will also say that many Swedes also fought bravely and skillfully. I won't say too much more though, because it's nearly impossible to make any general remark about the combat effectiveness of foreign volunteers. They are too small in numbers relative to other forces and too varied in their composition. But there are two things you can say that are relevant to all foreign volunteer forces in modern times. Their main benefit to the host country is a propaganda weapon and a whole lot of naive young men will get themselves killed if they don't know what they are doing. And that is the balance act that non-belligerent but supportive governments were faced with in 1939 and are again in 2022. A slack line to cross the chasm of propaganda and diplomacy. Below them is a swamp of legality, a roaring stream that might pull them into a war against their plans, and the jagged rocks of political death if you send your citizens unprepared into a battle that is not your own. The balancing rod is weighted with statements of dissuasion on one end and a lack of legal consequences for the volunteers on the other. We have just started a weekly podcast. To get the lowdown on that, subscribe to our Time Goes podcast channel right here. Come for the history, stay for the stories, and join the Time Ghost army to experience the podcast live every week on both audio and video and interact with the two of us directly. It is the Time Ghost Army that enables us to do what we do, document our past as factually and correctly as possible so that present and future generations can learn from their ancestors' successes and failures and work towards a better future in peace, prosperity, and freedom. Excelsior! Excelsior.